Good morning, everyone. Oh, that was pretty good. Can we do it again? Good morning, everyone. All right, that's perfect. Uh, before we start, um, Trudy does something that uh, I enjoy every time. Just look to your neighbor, look across the pews, wave hello, say so hello, happy Sabbath to someone sitting next to you. Uh, just take a minute to, to greet each other. For those of you watching on Zoom and listening to us on uh, Lighthouse FM VOAR, I'll wave and say hello to you. Welcome to our services this morning. That's great. It's wonderful to see so many smiling faces out here this morning. We are so glad that you can join us here this morning in the St. John Seventh-day Adventist Church for our worship time and our praise time. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Bill Simmons. I am the platform chair today, and that gives me the great opportunity to welcome each and every one of you here as well as to introduce those that will be participating in our service this morning. And guess what? You're participating this morning too, because when we sing, I want to hear your voices nice and loud. So up on the platform with me this morning doing scripture reading, we have Mark Jello, and Georgina is doing our call to offering. Our speaker this morning is our conference president, Pastor John Murley. He also will have our morning pastoral prayer. Our children's story this morning is going to be brought to us by Lily Pittman. Our music and praise time is going to be brought to us by, <clears throat> pardon me, by Second Advent. Um, and for those of you who think you can't step out of your comfort zone, let me tell you, myself and Kelly have joined Advent. We are the new singers. So that is a step out of my comfort zone. So if I can do it, so can you. So uh, be, bear with us. Another thing that's not in my comfort zone is I have brought my banjo. I do not normally play in public very often with that. So, um, but it's something that I've felt called to do and inspired to do. I enjoy the music. So uh, I invite you all to join us in our hymns and that and in our praise time this morning. Our call to worship this morning, I have picked a very popular verse found in Matthew 28, otherwise known as the Great Commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the Lord is with us here this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll open our service this morning now. If you'll join me, just bow your heads with an opening prayer. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to assemble here today both in person and over radio and over live stream as well. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together, to sing praises, to fellowship with you, Lord, and to hear the words that have been inspired to be spoken this morning. We pray that you're with each and every person here and that each one receives a special blessing this morning by being here with us. We thank you, Lord, for all these things. In your precious name, amen. This time we'll have our praise time. Right. 
Psalms 100, verses 2 to 4. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Amen. Amen. We are going to begin today with Here I Am to Worship. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 8 verse 18 I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people the next song we're going to play is open the eyes of my heart Oh, 
text, we're going to ask you to stand. Our opening song today is 205, Gleams of the Golden Morning. Happy Sabbath. The scripture reading for today be Titus 2, 11, 15. God's kindness and the new life. God has shown us how kind he is by coming to save, save all people. He taught us to give our wicked ways and our worldly desires and to live decent and honest lives in this world. We are filled with hope as we wait for the glorious return of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. He gave himself to rescue us from everything that the evil and to make his own heart pure. He wanted us to to be his own people and to encourage to do right. Teach these things as you for authority and encourage and correct people. Make sure you earn everyone's respect. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> you might think I'm a bit confused. 
In Canada, Thanksgiving was the second Monday of October, the 9th. In the United States, it won't be until next month, the fourth Thursday in November, which will be the 23rd. Why say Happy Thanksgiving today? Of course, any day can be Thanksgiving. And scripture gives us many reasons to give thanks, such as these. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. The works of his hands are faithful and just, and all his precepts are trustworthy. Psalms 111, verse 17. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. O oh Lord, what great works you do, and how deep are your thoughts. Only a simpleton would not know, and only a fool would not understand this. Psalm 92, verse 1. Five, six. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart th thrusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. Psalm 28, verse 6 to 7. National holidays for Thanksgiving come from expected harvest blessings. Most of us aren't farmers but we have experienced God's abundant blessings in so many ways. So today, join me in thanksgiving. We aren't limited to one day a year. Let's give to God from an abundant heart of praise and thanksgiving today. May the deacons please come forward to collect the Lord's tithe and offerings. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we cannot say thank you enough. Lord, just the words, thank you, Lord, just, it's just not enough, Lord, because you, you are such a wonderful God. You give us so many blessings, oh Lord, each and every day. Father, now we, we want to bring you, Lord, the tithes and offerings, Lord, and we ask that you accept them, oh God, and that they will be used for your intended use. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this time, we invite all the young people, young at heart if you so wish, to come down in the front here for our children's story. And Miss Lily, you can come on up forward.
So good morning, boys and girls. Uh, so the story I'm going to tell you today, I actually heard last Sabbath from Pastor John Murley, and I just thought that all boys and girls should hear it. So this story is about missionaries. Does anyone here know what a missionary is? Does anyone want to take it? Anyone want to say what a missionary is? A missionary is someone who goes out to preach the gospel. Yeah, a missionary is someone who goes out to tell people about God. So this story is about a girl named Jenna, and her parents were missionaries, and they would go out and they would invite people to these meetings and where they teach people about Jesus. So Jenna, she was very excited to help out with these meetings, but before she could before she could go out and help her parents with these meetings, help advertising for the meetings, and, and help inviting people, she got sick, so she had to stay home. She couldn't go help out with the meetings. But she still wanted to help out, so she prayed, and she asked God for a way to help out with the meetings, and she got an idea. She realized that her bedroom window looked out over the street where people would walk by. And so she went to her parents, and she asked her parents to move her bed over by her bedroom window. Her parents didn't know why she wanted to do this, but they did anyways. And when she had had her bed moved over by her bedroom window, she went and she took a piece of paper, and she wrote the piece of paper, and she wrote on the piece of paper, Jesus loves you. Come to the meetings to learn more. And so she opened her window, and she, took, she folded up the piece of paper with the message on it, and, and she waited. And she listened. And then she waited until she heard something. What do you think she was listening for? Yeah, people. So she heard somebody walking up the road, and she went and she took the paper, and she dropped it out the window. So that the person walking by, they would pick up the paper, they'd read it, and they'd say, oh, Jesus loves you. Come to the meetings to find out more. Well, what meetings are there? I'm going to go check out these meetings. And so she did this every day. Every time she heard somebody walking by, she dropped a piece of paper out the window with the message on it. And one day, when she heard somebody coming up the road, it was a police officer. And he saw her drop the piece of paper out the window. And he picked up the paper. He read it, and he thought, Somebody is littering. Who'd be dropping paper out the window? So he goes and knocks on the door, and Jenna's parents open the door. And he asks, hey, there's somebody throwing pieces of paper out the window. Do you know who it is? Someone in your house is throwing paper out the window. And Jenna's parents weren't doing it. They didn't know who was doing it. And the only person who could have been do it, doing it was Jenna. And so they let the police officer come in to talk to Jenna, and he went up to her and said, little girl, were you throwing paper out the window? She said, yes. And so he asked, why were you throwing paper out the window? Why would you be littering? And she said, well, I have prayed and I hope that somebody would pick up the paper and that they'd read it and that they'd learn about the meetings and that they'd go to the meetings and to learn about Jesus. And so... That, when she said that, that touched the police officer's heart. And so the next day, guess who was at the front row seat of the meeting? Yeah, the police officer. And so because she decided to, because she decided to find her own way to be able to spread God's word, she was able to help lead that police officer to come to know Christ. That's also very similar to a story in 2 Kings chapter 5. And in that story, there's a man named Naaman, and he was very sick with a skin disease. He had leprosy. And there was a little girl who was taken captive from Israel. And when she, fig and when she found out that Naaman had leprosy, she said that Naaman should go see Elisha, the man of God, that he might be healed. And so Naaman, he went out, he went to see Elisha, and he got healed. And the girl's name was never mentioned in the Bible, but still, she was a missionary, and that she was able to help Naaman to come to know God, because after Naaman was healed, he proclaimed that there was no other God other than the God of Israel. And so, 
The lesson today is that we can all be missionaries, no matter what our circumstances is, no matter who we are, no matter where we are. Okay, so let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the lesson we learned today that we can all be missionaries, and we pray that you'll help us all to be able to spread your word to someone else in some way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. At this time, I invite you to join us for our prayer song, Open Our Eyes, Lord, and following that, Pastor John will be leading us out in our pastoral prayer. I invite you at that time, wherever possible, to kneel or bow your heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, what a wonderful privilege it is this morning to come into your house to worship you, our Creator. We do not come to a God that is asleep. We do not come to a God who is dead, but we come to a God that is alive and still sits on the throne of heaven. We come to a God who created us for a relationship with him. And as we come to you this morning, our Heavenly Father, we come worshiping you as our creator. We worship you who created the heavens of the earth and everything that's in them. And when we think of your handiwork, we are in awe of your greatness. This morning as we have come, you have bidden us to come just as we are. And what that means is, is that we are coming to you this morning poor and sinful and in need of much. And so Father, this morning, enrich our lives by your word. Would you, this morning, forgive us of our shortcomings and our sins, just as we forgive those who, Lord, sin against us. As we come to you this morning, we are reminded that we are feeble creatures. We have broken bodies and broken spirits. We struggle, Lord, with life here on this earth, wondering how we will get by, where we will get the money, and what we should do next. We come to you this morning as a great counselor, praying that you will heal all of our relationships with family and friends and community. And we ask this morning that as, as we come into this house of prayer, as we lift our prayers up to you, that your ear would be inclined unto us, and that you will hear the soft, unspoken prayer coming from our hearts. 
for you know our every need. You know our desires. You know our wants and our needs. For there is nothing, O God, that's hidden from thee. This morning we pray that your presence will be here with us as we worship, as we sing the songs of faith, as we share in the experience of worship here this morning. May we, may we be reminded that we are before the God of everything, who did not think it pointless to become incarnate and become like us. And so we come knowing that you know our infirmities because you know the pains and the, the ills and the joys and the heartache and the challenges that life brings here on this earth. So we commit these to you. And now we ask God that you will give us ears that will hear and eyes that will see so that we might be able today to taste of the things that you have in store for us. Encourage us. May we leave this place filled, Lord, with a passion for you. Give us our daily bread, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone knows this song, right? The King is Coming. So I ask that you join in during the course and listen to the words. The Lord Jesus came as a baby. He came quietly the first time, but the second time every eye shall see him. Amen. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now 
I can hear the chariots rumble, I can see the marching throng, the flurry of God's trumpets spells the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding, heaven's grand stands all in place, heaven's choir is now assembled, start to sing amazing The good book says they all forsook him and fled. You're still here, are you? Good, good. I'm glad that you are with us this morning, and um, I am excited about the opportunity to be here and to spend these next um, few minutes with you. I have mixed emotions this morning as I stand here, having served as the pastor of this church for nine years, uh, way back when, and to come back now to lead the conference and the challenges that that brings with it. I look down on the face of this congregation this morning and it has changed. But that is life. Life moves forward and things change and people change. And we can do one of two things. We can embrace it and we can work with it or we can reject it and run away. I'm glad that you are faithful to Christ. I'm glad that you're here this morning. Today, we are celebrating the 179th anniversary of the great disappointment. It was 179 years ago that a group of people stood on a bunch of rocks near William Miller's farm and waited with great anticipation for the coming of Jesus Christ. It was, as it turned out, their second disappointment but we'll get into that in a few moments. But this morning I want to talk to you about a message that I have entitled, Finishing the Work. Now, let me tell you a secret. This is the third time this month that I have preached this message. And there are some of you who may have heard that. I know, Ruth, you have heard this. And, uh, and so she will be hearing it for the second time. But that's okay. My wife is with me, and she's heard it all three times. <laughs> and, um, and I got to hear my children's story from a different perspective. And Lily, you did a better job at telling it than what I did. And so I give you thanks for doing that. Would you bow your heads? Would you open your ears? But most importantly, would you open your hearts this morning? Heavenly Father, In the quiet of this sanctuary, we come to thee now because you are our God. And I would pray, Father, for the preacher this morning that you will forgive his sins for they are many. And that, Lord, you will plant in his mind and in his heart your words 
anoint the lips with a coal from your fire and give me power to preach. Give those who are listening ears to hear and eyes to see a vision for your soon coming. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Christopher, I thank you for the water that you brought. Um, the ice has since melted. But with your permission, I'm going to lay it down there because I tend to get excited. And I have visions of that glass going flying across the floor and startling all of you. It was the Battle of Plattsburgh where something stirred in the heart of one man. You may know a little bit about the War of 1812. You may know a little bit about the fact that those of us who now call ourselves Canadians, our ancestors, marched down into Washington, D.C., and we burned the White House. Now, I know we have somebody from Washington here this morning in the congregation. Our humble apologies for burning the White House. The War of 1812 between Britain and the United States, of course, we were all part of Britain at that point. And the Battle of Plattsburgh was a tremendous battle. It was incredible odds, a group of ragtag thrown together, American farmers and militia up against the power of the great British army. They were outnumbered. They were outgunned. The British were well trained. The British had tremendous leadership, tremendous battle plan. And at Plattsburgh, they brought the ships in. The British fleet came in, and, and they were firing cannon shells in, and it looked like it was going to be a complete rout for the British. But when the smoke cleared, it was the British who had lost the war. And that small group of American soldiers somehow, incredibly, was victorious. And amongst the ranks of that day was a young man by the name of William Miller, a farmer by trade. And he was there. He saw what happened. It was unbelievable to him. And it led him to question whether or not God intervenes in the affairs of mankind. Now see, what you may not know is that Miller was a deist. It means that he had a belief in God, but his understanding of God was that God simply started the whole world, kind of wound it up and just let it go, and never interfered in any way. But now for the first time in his life, Miller begins to question, could there really be a God that does intervene in the affairs of man? I mean, look at, look at the battle. How is it possible that us Americans could actually win this war except there was a God that was on our side? And thoughts begin to stir in his mind. Now, he's not a converted man by any stretch of the imagination. But as he's thinking about what he saw, how people died, how, how men were blown to pieces by war, how God intervened and God gave victory where there should have been none. He writes a little later in his journal, he says, annihilation was a cold and chilling thought. 
The heavens were as brass over my head and the earth as iron under my feet. Eternity. What was eternity? And death. Why was it even present? Now what Miller did not realize, what you and I should realize now, is that it was the Holy Spirit that was beginning to move on his mind and on his heart at that time. And so Miller comes back from that war, not too much of a changed man, except he's pondering these questions. I wonder, does God intervene in the affairs of man? Does God really care about his creatures? And if God really cares about his creatures, then how come there is such a thing as war? Why does he permit it? These are some of the questions that Miller is wrestling with. So when he comes back, he begins to attend the Baptist church. And then one day the preacher is not available. And so they had a reader stand in. And Miller would go to church on a regular basis. Because when the preacher wasn't there, as I said, the minister would have somebody read and Miller would sit back and he would make fun of the preacher. Until it was Miller's time to read because nobody else was available. He was given the sermon and the sermon was all about family and all about how God was a father that cared for his children. William Miller says that, that he was so moved by that experience that, that he decided to go deeper into Bible study. And so for the first time in his life, he's going to open a Bible. And he wants to know about God. What kind of God is in this book? And Miller began where everybody else begins who knows nothing about the Bible. I heard somebody in Sabbath school this morning say, uh, you know, uh, uh, start with the Gospels. That's good advice. But William Miller didn't have Catherine McVeigh to tell him exactly what, uh, where he should begin. And so Miller began where so many people begin in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And when he opened his Bible to Genesis 1, verse 1, it simply said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Miller wants to know, what type of God is he? Is he that loving father that that preacher had me read in the sermon there a few weeks ago? What type of God is he? Because how, how do I rationalize that God with a God who permits war? There are people today who are asking the same question. What type of God is he? And so he begins with that text. And his method of Bible study was very simple. It was the simplest method of all. He simply would start in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and he would begin to read. And as he began to read the verses, he would stop when he came to a word that he didn't understand. Now, he didn't have any concordances. All he had was a crudence, which is simply a book that records every word in the Bible and tells you where else it is used in the Bible. And so Miller's methodology in studying the Bible was that he would start in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and as he worked his way through and came to words that were unfamiliar to him, he would look up the words to find out exactly what they meant. And in the case where the word could mean two or three things, he wanted to find the best fitting. He was doing his own, what we call, inductive Bible study. And so as Miller begins to study the Bible, he's looking to see what kind of God is revealed in the Scriptures. He continued into that study, 
until sometime between 1816 and 1818, he came across a text that will be forever linked to him and was linked to him for the rest of his life and is still talked about today in association with William Miller. The text, if you want to read it, is found in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. It's a text that us as Seventh-day Adventists should know well. It's a text that you and I should be able to interpret, to share with our friends and our family and those within the community. Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 says this. It says, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But now here's a problem. What does that mean? And William Miller is anxious to find out. And so he begins to look up that word sanctuary. And he wants to see how that word sanctuary is used. And he discovers that in some places it refers to the earth. In some places it refers to a place where you worship. In other places it refers to a heavenly sanctuary. It even refers to the body as being a sanctuary. And so through the process of elimination, he ruled them all out. Needs to be cleansed. And thinks to himself, well, the heavenly sanctuary, there's nothing there that needs to be cleansed, so it has to be the earth. The earth is the place that has to be cleansed. And that led him to a very deep study. And as he dug deeper and deeper, he came to the conclusion that that passage in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 meant that Jesus was coming to cleanse the earth in the second coming. Miller went so far as to even set a date for the return. Because it hit him. Jesus is coming back. And according to Miller, based upon his study, he felt that Jesus was going to return in about 25 years down the road. Well, let me ask you a question this morning. If you've been studying your Bible and you've come to the conclusion that Jesus is coming in 25 years, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? He's got a dilemma because William Miller is not a preacher. William Miller is a ex-military guy, Captain William Miller, and he certainly doesn't feel qualified to stand up in the pulpit and preach because after all, his only experience is that somebody has written sermon that he has read. And he recognizes that he was one of the people who sat in the pew and made fun of the one who was reading the scripture and one who was giving the sermon. But Miller missed something very important that so many of us miss as well. And that is that God chooses people that he wants to complete his work. And oftentimes they are the most unlikely candidates. Moses was a murderer. Gideon was a fearful farmer. David was an overlooked shepherd. Peter was an impetuous fisherman. Paul was a persecutor of the faith. Martin Luther was a simple monk. The list could go on and on. The scriptures are filled with individuals who are unqualified to give God's word by human standards. 
And the reality is this morning is that most of us within the church feel unqualified to say anything about the second coming of Jesus because we're not theologians, we're not preachers, and many of us haven't even studied our Bible. And so this morning, Miller did not begin to preach what he had studied. In fact, he was reluctant to even share with his close friends and family, even though he himself was convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus was coming. He simply did not feel qualified to share the truth with anybody else. And then one day, it happened. That Baptist preacher from that local church had been called away. And Miller, much to his chagrin, had been suggested by his aunt who happened to be there that why don't we ask Farmer Miller to come and to teach us about what he's been studying about Jesus. And so the knock came on the door. He got the invitation, but he was not happy about the invitation. In fact, he was really downright angry. In fact, he was so angry, he left the house and he went out into the maple grove near his house and he is shaking his fist in God's face and saying, how dare you ask me to do this? While he's out underneath the maple grove, shaking his fist at God, hitting the trees, flailing his arms around, his little daughter Lucy comes out sees her father in the maple grove and she sees the state that he's in and she runs back to the house and she calls for her mother. Mother, mother, come quick. Something has happened to Papa. In fact, something had happened to Papa. Something had happened to William Miller. He went into that maple grove, an angry farmer, but he came out of that maple grove a preacher. Because here's what I've learned about Jesus, folks. Here's what I've learned about God. He meets us where we are. Even in our anger. Even in our frustrations. Even in our hurts. He meets us where we are, but he never leaves us there. He always carries us to something better. In that maple grove, Miller eventually came to make a commitment to God that if, if I am asked, hopefully nobody will ask, but if I am asked, I will go. He's back at his house only a few hours when a nephew of his from the church at Dresden came over and gave him the invitation you're asked to come and preach at the church this Sunday. Miller, fresh off the Maple Grove experience, agreed to go. He agreed to give his first talk, his first lecture on the coming of Jesus as he understood it. But Miller was so nervous and, and was so so afraid of what people would think or say about him that he asked that the church not be held in the sanctuary, but that people come to a farmhouse nearby and everybody would sit in that farmhouse and he sat at the kitchen table and gave his message. He didn't feel qualified. The people got so excited about what it was that he had to say that he ended up staying for a whole week. And it seemed like once Miller got started, he had a lot more to say. And so he stayed for a whole week. When he got home, there was a request for another Baptist pastor to come and speak at his church. And so within two weeks of being in that maple grove, William Miller has now had two opportunities to give a full message on the second coming of Jesus. More and more invitations came along. 
the invitees, or the invites rather, continue to increase and, and to spread out, much, much like a pebble when you, when you throw it into a pond of water that's perfectly still, and, and that rock hits the center of that pond and the ripples spread out. That's what Miller's preaching was like. From that very first moment, it increased and got more and more and more. But now something amazing begins to happen. Don't miss this. Don't miss this because, you know, people have been talking about the second coming of Jesus for years and years and years prior to William Miller. But now suddenly something begins to happen and revival breaks out and all of the local pastors want to be a part of that, you know? You want to go where, where this new guy has got new information and his preaching is turning the world upside down in that local community and suddenly revival is broken out and now more invitations come. In fact, by 1835, William Miller is actually preaching in Canada. It was here in Canada, by the way, that a little old woman walked up to him and gave him two half dollars. Not much by our standard today. And it certainly wasn't a whole lot in his day. But that was the first time anybody had ever paid him to share the word of God. Now, while Miller was out preaching, accepting invitation after invitation, his, his family worked hard to maintain the farm. Miller was seldom ever given anything for his preaching. He was the first self-supporting missionary, so to speak, that we would call in the modern era. Miller was so convinced that Jesus was coming again that his messages was having such a powerful impact and, and the work was growing. But 1939 comes along, and Miller has still not yet preached in any big city. It's all been these local little country Baptist churches and a few other non-denominational churches thrown in here and there along the way. But he hadn't been to the seacoast, he hadn't been to Philadelphia, hadn't been to Boston, hadn't been to New York. In 1839, a young man by the name of Timothy Cole, who was a pastor, invited Miller to come and speak in Lowell, Massachusetts. So Cole writes Father Miller, as he was affectionately referred to as, and invites him to come and says at the end of the letter, by the way, how will I recognize you when you get off the train? Miller said, I will be the one wearing a white hat and a cameo coat. Now, in case you hunters here think that he was into, you know, camouflage coats, he's referring to the fact that his coat was old and well-worn and well-patched. Now, what you may not know about Miller is this. Miller was only five foot seven when he put his boots on. He was fat in the face. He had a bull-like neck. And he was a bit overweight. And some people would say that he kind of resembled me, or I kind of resembled him. But the one thing that you may not know about Miller is that William Miller also suffered from tremors, perhaps as a result of the war and shells landing near him. And so his arm and his hand would shake as though someone who has palsy. And so there is that fateful day. Reverend Cole, this young, outstanding pastor in his own right, is standing on the train station dock waiting for the train to come up and suddenly it appears and there out of nowhere through the cloud of steam comes a man wearing a white hat carrying a trunk with a cameo coat 
And Cole says that he was not impressed. There was nothing about William Miller that impressed this upstart pastor. In fact, he was rather embarrassed that I, Timothy Cole, has invited this old man into my pulpit. Sure, just look at him. He looks like he has just come out of the farm working with animals. He was embarrassed. He thought about canceling, but Miller was already there. Miller began his scripture reading with Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15, which is why we chose that today. Let me read it to you from the Message Bible. God's readiness to give and forgive is now public. Salvation's available for everyone. We're being shown how to turn our backs on a godless, indulgent life and how to take on a God-filled, God-honoring life. This new life is starting right now and is whetting our appetites for the glorious day when the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, appears. He offered himself, a sac uh, he offered himself as a sacrifice to free us from a dark, rebellious life into this pure, pure life, making us a people he can be proud of, energetic in goodness. Tell them all of this. Build up their courage. Discipline them if they get out of line. You're in charge. Don't let anyone put you down. Miller begins to share. Begins to share with the people why he believes that Jesus is soon returning. He taught them about the 2300-day prophecy. And by this time, Miller had actually pinpointed a date. According to William Miller, Jesus was going to come on March 21st, 1843. The impact was so powerful. 1843. That's just four years from now. And suddenly, revival breaks out in the Reverend Timothy Cole's church, and now over 700 people are going out and telling people what they have seen and what they have heard. Jesus is coming in just a few years. But March 21, 1843 came and went, and Jesus did not come. And immediately the newspapers of that day began to attack Miller and his teachings. Many doubts were cast at Miller. Someone asked him about the disappointment, and here is what his response was when he was asked, are you disappointed that Jesus did not come on March 21, 1843? And here is what he said, why then should I complain if God should give a few days or even months or more as a probation time for some to find salvation. It is my Savior's, if it is my Savior's will, then I rejoice that he will do all things right. Miller's attitude? Let them call me whatever they want. Let the kids on the street riddle me, ridicule me. Let the newspapers make fun of me. Now there are some of you sitting here today some of you are listening by way of VOAR radio. There are some of you here today who understand what it's like to be made fun of for Jesus Christ. And what is it? What is it to me if Jesus wants to wait a little while longer so that he can save a few more people? It's not fun, brothers and sisters, being a believer in the second coming of Jesus. We are living in a society today that is anti-Christ. And they will make fun of you because you believe in the scriptures, because you believe in a God who said that he was coming and still hasn't come, and now we're at 2023. People will talk about you People will make fun of you and put you down. People will say that you have gone nuts. I grew up as a member of another church, of a Sunday-keeping church. 
and when my family left that church to, to go to Seventh-day Adventism, to believe in the Sabbath and the soon coming of Jesus, my own grandparents would pass by our house on a Sunday. Regularly they would come and visit with us, but no more. They would turn their heads and go a, a different direction. The United Church minister wrote a letter to those in his congregation to tell his congregation that we were gone off the deep end and we were to be shunned. I know what it's like to feel persecuted. I know what it's like to be rejected and put down. I know what it's like to be laughed at because you believe in something with all your heart and all your soul. But listen to me this morning. We have been preaching as Seventh-day Adventists the nearness of Jesus' second coming for the past 179 years. That's why today we are celebrating this day, a reminder of where we came from. And we still wait. But listen, what if it takes a little bit more time so that Jesus can try to save more people who he died for. Are you okay with that? After the first disappointment, during the summer of 1844, many of Miller's followers proposed a new date, October 22nd, 1844. Now Miller also knew that the Bible says that no man knows the day or the hour. So he was a little skeptical now. But he could not ignore what happened in those four years leading up to 1844. He could not ignore what was happening after that first disappointment. He could not ignore what was happening as people began to prepare their lives for Jesus. Farmers didn't take their crops up. People sold houses and lands. People gave things away. And while they were doing so, people would say things like this. Do you have your ascension robe ready? Is it spotless? You may be a little bit shocked this morning to learn that William Miller himself really didn't endorse the October 22nd date until October the 6th, just a little over two weeks before. And when he did accept it, he wrote these words in his journal, glory, 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 I'm almost home. What was convincing Miller was not the scriptures, but rather it was the powerful impact of the first angel's message was having, where people, where his lives were being changed, people were preparing for Jesus to come. It was unlike anything he had witnessed up to that point. And so he said, God has to be in this. So now they had a date, a second date. And on the night of October 21st of 1844, many of the local believers gathered in William Miller's home and he addressed them, telling them that Jesus was coming when they least expected him. Even though he was expecting Jesus the next day, he's not sure that it's going to happen and he thinks that they will be disappointed the next day. You see, William Miller had one concern and that was that everything be biblically accurate. Oh, if the churches of today of the world would have such a concern. The foolishness that's preached out of pulpits today would be not biblically accurate. And finally that morning came, October 22nd of 1844. The sun rose. After years now of tireless preaching where he had worn himself out almost to the point of death, giving of all of his time that he had, giving of all of his resources. He's there in his house reading his Bible. Occasionally he would walk out to the Ascension Rocks as it came to be known. And he would walk back. 
There were people with him who were worn out from preaching. People who had sold everything. People who had said goodbye to those that they know. And now they're waiting on this rocky outcrop just north of Miller's farmhouse. And they search the skies, waiting for the Savior to come and take them home. And the hours pass. And suddenly October 22nd turns into October 23rd and Jesus had not come. And now Miller, now Father Miller has gone through two major disappointments. And here is what he wrote shortly after in his own words. He says, I have fixed my mind on another time and here I stand until God gives me more light, and that is today, today, and today, until he comes. William Miller remained active in public life for about two more years, but his health was so broken. He had given everything for the first angel's message. Now you need to understand that Miller only gave the first angel's message. Fear God and give honor to him, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. That was the only message that Willie Miller gave. He didn't give the other two of the three angels' messages. He never made a call for people to come out of churches, to come out of Babylon. He never made a call to them about receiving the mark of the beast. William Miller never understood, nor did he accept or preach the Sabbath. William Miller never understood the state of the dead. All of his energies, all of his energies was given to the preaching of the first angel's message. A friend of his from the West Coast wrote him about the second disappointment. And here's what he said in response. Look, look again. See crowns and kings and kingdoms tumbling to the dust. See the lords and nobles, captains and the mighty men all arming for the bloody demon fight. See the carnivorous fowls fly screaming through the air. See, see, see these signs. Behold, the heavens grow black with clouds. The sun has veiled himself. The moon, pale and forsaken, hangs in the middle air. The hail descends. The seven thunders utters loud their voices. The lightning send their vivid gleams of sulfurous flames abroad. And the great city of the nation falls to rise forever, to no more forever and ever. At this dread moment, look. Look, oh look and see, what means that ray of light? The clouds have burst asunder, the heavens appear, the great white throne is in sight, amazement fills the universe with awe. He comes, he comes, behold, your Savior comes, lift up your head, ye saints, he comes, he comes, he comes. He signed the letter simply, William. So what are we going to do about it? We're sitting here today celebrating 179 years since that second disappointment. And we're gathered in this church here in this capital city of our province. And we are Seventh-day Adventists who have been given three angels' messages They are to be the last message that is given to the world. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Come out of her, my people. Come out of confusion. Come out of Babylon. Join with the people of God. Do not stay there and receive the mark of the beast. And that's the message that we have been called to give. But now I have to ask you a very important question. Don't raise your hands, just your conscience. How real and how vivid is the second coming of Jesus to you? Is it on your heart? 
Is it on your waking thoughts in the morning? Do you think about it during the day? And my second question is this. What are you going to do about it? If you believe that Jesus Christ is coming, if you believe that time is short, my question for the church of the Almighty is this, what are you doing about it? William Miller gave his practically his life, his health and his strength, and was bitterly disappointed twice, but remained faithful to his belief that his friend Jesus was coming. You know how it is with us? We've heard it all so many times it becomes boring. Do I've heard all that before. Well, we're having a series of meetings. I'm going to read a revelation seminar. Oh, yeah, I've been to thousands of those. I don't need to go hear that. You're not coming to hear it again for yourself, but maybe you are. But you're coming to support those who are preaching the word. There are people today sitting at home that need to be in church here. There are people today that are sitting at home that need to be in church. We can go anywhere we want to go, but when it comes to Sabbath morning, gathering with God's saints, fellowshipping in the knowledge that we belong to a unique group of people is not important. I can find every excuse to not come. See, here's the thing. William Miller thought that everyone he saw was a candidate for heaven. Do you know what that means? Your neighbor, that crack house that used to be in the neighborhood. I don't know whether it's still here or not, but it was. When I was pastoring here, there'd be drug deals that would go on in the back of the church here. And once the police came to me and asked if they could set up a camera back there so they could observe some of the things that were going on. Do you know something? Jesus came for that person. Do you want to know something else this morning? Jesus came for that person who's involved in the gay and lesbian lifestyle. And the only difference between their sin and our sin in God's eyes is that there is none. There is no difference. So let me ask you again this morning in closing, how about you this morning? How about you? How real is it for you? How excited are you about belonging to a church that has been given a message that is to go to all of the world? Not just Africa and South America, but St. John's and Conception Bay and Marystown and Lethbridge and Cape Friels, and Bonavista, and Botwood, and Cornerbrook, and all points in between. It's time. It's time this morning that we got serious about finishing the work that Jesus Christ has given us to do. And what should motivate us and what should drive us forward on our knees is the knowledge that Jesus is coming. And he's 179 years closer now than when William Miller was alive. So what you going to do about it, church? What you going to do about it? Are we going to be the same as we always were? Are we going to allow ourselves to lull into a sleep and then slip quietly out the door? And when the last one is out, we close off the doors and we turn off the lights. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has a life-giving message. We have the message of salvation that is to be given to the whole world. And it's about time that we awoke out of our slumber and our sleep and we decided that we are going to get serious about our faith. Now listen up. God doesn't need everybody. God doesn't need everybody. He only needs those that are committed. He only needs those who believe. So in closing this morning, are you committed to finishing the work? 
Do you believe that Jesus is coming soon? And if that is the case, my question to you is what you're going to do about it. to rise again and we're going to sing 212 loudly yes if you believe it I want to hear it signs are all fulfilled. We are nearer now than we've ever been. The night will soon turn to day, and we recognize that we ourselves need to prepare, and we need to prepare the people of this city for your soon return. Would you bless this congregation, Pastor Stephen, as he leads? It is our great prayer, God, this morning that we will leave this place having our ears opened and our hearts especially opened to be receptive to what we have heard. Bless those who are at home and those who are present in the sanctuary today as we go from this place now with your blessing. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>